Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a great session uh, for today. Uh, we do have a bunch of people uh, still joining in, though. So we're going to wait probably a couple of minutes more, um, and then we'll get started. So uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be back shortly. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we still have people joining in, so we'll wait maybe one or two minutes more and then we'll get started. Uh, thanks for your patience. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us uh, today. We have a great session ahead of us. Um, this is the Gigaspaces Digital Innovation 101, how to accelerate your digital transformation journey. Uh, my name is Noam Herzenstein. I'm uh, Director of Product Marketing with Gigaspaces. And uh, co-presenting with me today is uh, Ari ben Yehuda, uh, Product Director. Uh, just uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Gigaspace, it's just very briefly, uh, we've been around for a couple of decades. Uh, we are among the pioneers of in-memory computing. Uh, as you can see here on the right, 
We have some of the uh, largest companies in the world trust us, uh, our data platform uh, with their data. Uh, the likes of Bank of America, American Airlines, Goldman Sachs, uh, UBS, Delantis, uh, and uh, many, many more. So today's session is gonna focus on uh, a, a rather new architecture paradigm called the Digital Integration Hub and how it can accelerate digital uh, transformation. So um, before we really start, uh, just a very quick poll for you guys. We're gonna, we're gonna show the poll on the screen here shortly, anonymous poll. Uh, and the question is really, where are you uh, maturity wise uh, on the journey for, uh, for digital transformation? So if you can take a few seconds um, and vote and we'll uh, uh, share the results shortly. We're gonna wait just a few more seconds, give a chance for folks to vote and take a quick look at the results. Then we're gonna start. Okay, let's see if we can put the results up on the screen. Few more seconds. Okay, great. Uh, so let's take a look. The 38% uh, voted that they are in early phases of digital transformation. Uh, we have a few uh, that haven't started yet, 90%. 30% are, are in the planning and design phases. 25% um, are in advanced stages. And uh, not surprising at all, 6%. Uh, I would say only 6% uh, indicated that really successfully completed their digital transformation journey. Um, great, awesome. So uh, let's get started. So let's talk about um, digital transformation, right? So why, why do we do digital transformation? Uh, it's not for bragging rights. It's not just to check the box. Um, we have, uh, you know, it's not for, because of the pandemic. By the way, uh, digital transformation started way, way before the, the, the pandemic. Of course, it was uh, accelerated uh, due to, to the pandemic. But really, the reason that we are doing that, uh, starting uh, from, from the business side, right? We have business objectives that you would like to achieve, whether it's looking at revenues, whether you're looking at market share, uh, reducing customer churn, um, operational efficiency, reducing cost, etc. But it's really all boils down to uh, the customer experience, right? The, 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 Consumer taste has shifted. Everybody would like to consume their services uh, via digital channels. Everybody is doing it. Uh, our competitors are doing it, right? In every space, all the other players are doing it. So it's no longer a question of should we do that or even a question of when should we uh, do that? Uh, it, it's more of a question, how can we get that there as fast as possible? And we don't have the luxury to wait. And we'll see some examples around that. So those are kind of the, this is where we start, right? We have our business objective, but as we start on the path to digital transformation, we many times come across those kinds of technical challenges, right? And many of the technical challenges stem from the fact that we have a lot of legacy systems, legacy platforms in our organization. And the thing about those legacy platforms is that again, many times they were not designed or not originally designed 
to support the, the load, the extra load of uh, you know, all those digital queries, digital transactions that we are getting. And then we are starting to look at issues like latency, right? The performance, you know, how, how, how fast the data is traveling back uh, to the application. Uh, scalability, right? A lot of the uh, legacy platforms uh, were not designed to scale and to support the real-time um, transactions that we have, right? But actually, a lot of those uh, system of record applications were designed for more of a kind of batch use cases, right? Operational reporting uh, run overnight, and they were not really designed to support the real-time, uh, uh, you know, digital consumption that is expected from the new digital application, right? Some other challenges, uh, technical challenges, stem from the fact that data is scattered across uh, different places, right? So we, we may have multiple databases, multiple systems of record, and this, the, the business entity, right? Whether it's a customer you know, or account or something else, uh, the information about it is in lots of different places. So we get a 360 uh, view uh, of, for example, a customer requires us to look at lots of different places. They are not always synchronized. Um, another kind of side of a similar problem, uh, we sometimes have silos, right? Uh, sometimes across business units. We see it a lot, by the way, in, uh, in insurance companies. Uh, where, for example, your, your health insurance is all housed and managing one uh, mainframe, for example, and the property and casualty is all managing this completely separate uh, mainframe. But for me as the consumer, right, the customer of this, uh, of this company, you know, if I have several you know, policies, uh, I would like to see it all on a single screen when I log into the app. I don't care that there are silos and business units behind the scenes. Uh, so those are the kind of technical challenges uh, that we are facing. And I would like to give you maybe three or four actual examples. Those are from, from customers of ours and companies that we are working with, uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a, of a taste or flavor of the types of challenges that you get. And starting with um, a, a digital bank, and this is actually a company that was born digital, right? It's not a, it's not a traditional bank, but they started I don't know, maybe 15 years ago as a digital, pure digital bank uh, in Sweden, uh, the largest uh, stockbroker in Sweden, by the way. And, you know, when they started, obviously they were competing with, uh, with the uh, traditional banks, right? And then later on, more digital banks came along and they were competing with those as well. Uh, but when we recently talked to them, and we asked them about, you know, their competition, we got a very, very interesting, even surprising um, answer, you can see it on the screen, right? Um, when their customer, right, is, uh, for example, uh, you know, she, she picks up her kid from school or from practice, and she sits in the car, and she, uh, just alone with the phone, right, with the, with the mobile phone, and she has maybe five minutes. Uh, and she can spend those five minutes on Facebook, or Instagram, or she can spend it on the bank's mobile app and do some trading. Right, so the whole sense of competition now completely changes. It was, it almost sounds ridiculous that a you know, digital bank is competing with Instagram, but this is, those kind of situations are becoming the reality in the digital world. Uh, next example, and this is now uh, a traditional a, a retail bank, right? The, guy, the bank with you know, branches, brick and mortar branches. Um, and they are in the midst of their digital transformation kind of journey and they have hundreds and hundreds of digital services that they plan to build. The problem is that their, their, their existing architecture, uh, again, was not designed to support that. So yes, of course, they can build digital services and digital applications, but this is a very slow process. It's a lot slower than what they need uh, uh, and the pace that they need based on their plans to, you know, to meet the competition and actually to be ahead of the competition. Um, another example, and this is a, an, an e-commerce website, really a service that is doing price comparison, right? So they're tracking millions of products and, and thousands of different shops uh, and online retailers, and they can find you your product and they can find you the best price where you can you know, buy it in, in the best price, right? Now, now, this example goes back to the beginning of COVID. And you guys may remember the beginning of COVID, there was a very big problem getting COVID-related uh, products, right? Think uh, COVID masks, 
or hand sanitizers, etc., it was impossible to find it. It was out of stock everywhere, right? So the challenge at that point for, for people were not so much, hey, where can I get this product a little bit cheaper, but where can I get it at all? And uh, what this company decided to do was they had a great idea. Let's develop a new service that allows our customers to register, to sign in, to get an alert, right? I would like to get an alert for um, COVID mask or any other product. And as soon as it's back in stock in any company, right, in any, in any seller, just send me an alert immediately. I would like to buy it. So from, from idea to production, right, from inception through developing this service and launching it, uh, it took them two days, which is, which is amazing, almost unheard of, right? Which means that you need to have, you know, your, your data architecture or, your, or the data model, everything readily available. So when you are developing uh, new services, enhancing existing services, you can do it very quickly. You don't need to worry about data integration. You can just focus on the business logic and developing those awesome services. Um, and finally, maybe last, the last example that we'll take a look at, um, and this is a retailer. I think uh, groceries, right? Uh, one of the largest retailers in Australia. And they formed a, um, a digital arm. That was five years ago. And the first thing they did was to move from on-prem um, to the cloud. Uh, and they moved to one of the largest public clouds, right? So what they did was kind of uh, a lift and shift. In other words, they took their architecture as is. They did not re-architect anything, right? As is, and just instead of hosting it in the basement, right, in their own data center, it's now being hosted on the public cloud. The thing is that since they didn't change anything, they are still relying on you know, pretty outdated you know, data development techniques, uh, relational databases with stored procedures. And sure, they can develop digital services on top of that, but it's very slow. Now that was uh, okay five years ago in terms of the pace of innovation and the pace of developing new services. Uh, but you know, fast forward five years, right? Certainly through the pandemic. And now this is no longer enough, right? This, this is just slowing them down. And, and the fact that they need sometimes three or four different uh, functions in the organization, just uh, not, not even to develop a new data-based service, but, but even to, to change something in an existing digital service. Uh, they need the, the API developer and the service developer uh, and the DBA uh, and an infrastructure guy, all to coordinate a single change in regards to data. So uh, this architecture, which is, let's say, not that modern, um, is slowing them down. So uh, let's, let's drill down a little bit more and understand why is that happening, right? And what we see here on the screen is kind of a traditional or a conventional uh, architecture uh, that we see everywhere in, in every organization or many, many organizations across different verticals, right? What we see here, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. We have the systems of record at the bottom and we have the digital applications, right? The digital channels here at the top and they need to consume this data. And this is a, a highly coupled uh, architecture, right? And the integration is, you could look at it as a request-based integration. In other words, every time this little guy, this mobile app needs a piece of data from this system of record, it needs to go and fetch the data from the system of record. Of course, it goes through composite services. There is some integration logic, but every time I need to read the piece of data, I need to hit the system of record. And by the way, I need data from multiple places. So I need to hit them all and we get this, you know, the same goes to this application and so forth. We get this spaghetti uh, kind of structure and this, uh, this very strong coupling is very, very uh, problematic. So from technical standpoint, um, we need to worry about all those data integration kind of um, um, efforts, right? And so uh, rather than spending on just building business logic, we need to make sure that we are synchronizing between different layers. Maybe we put a cache on top of that and to synchronize between the cache and the, uh, and the data store and make sure that the data that is uh, getting to the digital services is the right one and the most up-to-date one and it's fresh and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of coding. Uh, we need to sometimes reinvent the wheel because what we did for this application, we need to do for that application and so forth. So a lot of technical challenges. And of course, the end of the day, 
this leads to business implications, right? And maybe the most important one is that you are very slow to introduce new, new digital services. It's just this architecture is not really empowering you to really develop very fast uh, a, a large amount of digital applications. Uh, and there are additional business uh, implications as well. For example, if uh, there is some regulation involved in your environment, could be open banking, could be CO2 emissions, could be COVID related regulation and so forth. Then if you are late in launching your digital service, it's, it, it's not just a business impact, it's also uh, a regulatory issue, maybe fines, maybe other uh, implications, the other business implications like like cost, for example, sometimes there is a cost every time you are uh, access cost, right? Every time you are uh, hitting a system of record. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, we have the customer experience. So it's very hard to deliver great customer experience uh, to meet and beat what the competitors are doing uh, with such an, an environment. So today we would like to, to kind of introduce or, or discuss um, a new paradigm, a new type of architecture, and you can see it here, let's just highlight it. It's called a digital integration hub. You can see it here, we are, we are looking at the Gartner hype cycle for application architecture uh, and integration. And digital integration hub, you see it's right here, it's almost at the, at the peak of, of the hype cycle. Uh, it's relatively new, it's not that new, it's, it's been around for two or three years already or being discussed. Uh, the, the terminology, the term, Digital Integration Hub or DIH was, was coined by, by Gartner, but it's really reflecting a trend that, is, that has been going on uh, in the industry uh, in recent years. And uh, we would like to kind of talk about that uh, today. So let's look at uh, a, a DIH powered uh, architecture, right? So what we see here, and you can, if you kind of compare it to the architecture we've just seen uh, two slides ago, if you remember the one which is really heavily coupled uh, and, and there is a request-based integration. The main difference when we are talking about a digital integration hub architecture is that we are decoupling between the data APIs, right? The ones who are powering the digital applications, decoupling between them and the systems of record. So now we have some kind of middleware, if you will, a high performance data store. And which includes a unified data model. All the relevant data, in other words, all the, the data that is required to power those digital services is being replicated here to this data store, right? So it's not replacing the systems of record. They're still doing exactly the same, but we have uh, a real-time replication. And the way we do it is by event-based integration rather than request-based. So when we are reading the data, doesn't matter, we read it once, a thousand times, a million times, it, it will always be accessed uh, here in this uh, high performance data store. We don't need to hit the system of record anymore. The only time where we are hitting it, actually from the other direction is when there is some kind of a data event, right? So when something changes here in the system of record, we would like to immediately reflect that change in the DIH. And this is done, of course, with technologies uh, such as CDC, change data capture, uh, that allow for this, for this event-based uh, integration. So we are decoupling. We can build all our microservices here on the top. Uh, we, we can get uh, really low latency and high performance because again, we're uh, working against this high performance data store uh, and the event-based uh, integration. So what are the benefits of um, uh, a, a DIH, a digital um, integration hub architecture. So you can look at it from, a, from really from a three uh, types of stakeholders. From a business perspective, right? Maybe the most important benefit is that we are accelerating in, in, in innovation. We, we can accelerate the pace of, of building, creating and launching new digital services because the data is readily available. There is a unified data model that reflects everything we need everything the digital application need and we can uh, get there faster. Uh, also the customer experience uh, is much, much better. And by the way, sometimes we can actually even reduce costs by reducing uh, system of record uh, access fees. 
So that's the, uh, those are the kind of benefits from a business perspective. If we are looking at the developers, maybe the main benefit is that they don't need to worry about data integration anymore. They don't need to worry about synchronizing between different data layers, the, the cache and the data store and the system of record. They can focus on building awesome uh, digital applications, just focusing on the business logic. They can do it faster uh, with less custom coding. And finally, from an operation standpoint, uh, simplicity, right? Whether it's enabling this always on, you know, 24 uh, seven type of service, uh, as well as handling pick loads, right? So if we have, you know, Black Friday or Christmas or what have you, and we have a pick load, and then we wanna go back to the normal load very easily uh, done uh, by the operations. So at this point, we would like to kind of drill down a little bit more and, and take a look at Smart DIH, which is our implementation of an out of the box um, digital integration hub. And uh, Ari will take it from here. Thank you, Noam. Uh, by the way, people say that we look alike. We're not the same person. This is the reason that I wear glasses so you can tell the difference. Um, so, Smart DIH. Um, uh, as uh, Noam explained, the DIH architecture is uh, made of uh, three uh, main layers. And uh, our product, our Smart DIH, combines all those three layers into one holistic uh, product. And the three layers, as you can see them here in the middle, uh, you, you have the, the host layer in the middle, they are a robust and the well-known uh, data grid uh, that uh, has a great, uh, great performance with low latency and the other features that I will get into uh, later, which uh, holds the data for immediate uh, serving. Uh, we have the integrate layer on the bottom that uh, knows how to integrate and how to ingest uh, changes through a CDC mechanism from all different kinds of, um, of uh, data sources. Uh, you, you can see some examples uh, down below, uh, RDBMS, uh, SQL and non-SQL, uh, many types of uh, legacy data sources, just to name a few, DB2, IMS, vSUM uh, on ZOS or mainframe, as some of you may know it. And uh, of course, cloud, all kinds of uh, cloud uh, data sources. Uh, the, the main idea of uh, this, uh, this layer is it can integrate easily with any uh, data source with the minimal uh, customization if, it, if it's not provided as, a, as an out of the box uh, connector of ours. Um, on the north side or on the top, or the top layer is the digitized layer, as we call it, this is the microservices layer, uh, where we um, um, a, 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 uh, introduce uh, APIs or uh, microservices uh, that uh, uh, let applications, applications, digital applications consume uh, the, uh, the data, and those can be integrated into um, uh, into all kinds of uh, applications, web application, uh, 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 operational applications, uh, mobile applications, etc., as well as to uh, reporting tools. Uh, of course, uh, we can uh, replicate this uh, whole uh, cluster into other um, into other uh, clusters. I will uh, get into it uh, a little bit later. And uh, on top of all, we have uh, orchestration done by Kubernetes and our tools for configuring, uh, monitoring, and uh, controlling the, the whole cluster. Um, so I will now get a little bit uh, into details of each of uh, those layers. So when talking about data integration, um, uh, where some of the, the features that uh, we provide, we provide the, the ability to, to collect data uh, through different uh, mechanisms, CDC, ETL, batch, streams. Uh, and like Noah mentioned, it's uh, all event driven. Uh, so all, those, uh, all this uh, information is updated in almost uh, real time within our data store and ready uh, to be served uh, to the applications. Uh, data, whatever data that is ingested into the system is validated and cleansed uh, in order to uh, avoid uh, issues 
uh, of data, which is something that uh, usually whoever works with data knows that uh, this is something that uh, may uh, cause uh, delays of update or uh, data, uh, all kinds of data issues. Uh, data is reg registered so you can trace back uh, the origins and the, uh, the data, uh, the, where data was loaded from. And uh, finally, we distribute them into the partitions of our uh, hosting uh, layer. Oh, one, one more thing that uh, I forgot to mention, the, the, the no code thing, all of this is done by configuration only through UI or through um, uh, CLI, no need to, to code. Uh, one, uh, one other cool feature that, uh, that, that we have uh, is uh, while well, uh, having a CDC stream, many times the, the schema of the origin or the schema of, uh, of our data store is not, uh, is not constant, it keeps changing. We add a new table to the system of record. Uh, we want to introduce a new table uh, to, the, uh, to the services that uh, serve the data. We have some uh, data issue for all kinds of reasons and we want to patch all data. We have some transactions that are missing from, from, uh, from past, uh, uh, from past uh, banking activity, for instance. Usually when working with, uh, with CDC, uh, with CDC stream, you have to stop the update uh, for such uh, events, uh, assuming that the tables depend uh, one, to one on another in order to, to maintain um, one level of updatability. Uh, but we, we developed a, a unique mechanism that allows you to, um, uh, that allows you to keep the CDC stream running and on top of an active CDC stream, which means that you still get all the updates uh, flowing in for all the existing tables, you can still add a new, uh, a new table from the system of record that will have the same uh, transactional um, um, status as the other tables. Uh, you can also patch all data without interfering with the uh, existing CDC stream. And um, this is all done, as I mentioned, by a unique uh, mechanism uh, that, uh, that we uh, introduce as part of our uh, data integration layer. Um, now let's uh, talk a little bit about the host layer, the, the data grid. Or, or data grid. Um, so regarding organization, we, uh, the, our data grid is organized as a multi-partition um, multi-partition um, cluster uh, where we uh, can scale it in and out as needed. Uh, we have uh, the ability to uh, balance between performance and cost with storage sharing. I will get uh, a little bit into it uh, in the next slide or two. Um, and we know how to ingest and maintain all kinds of format. We can maintain structured uh, data, um, data that uh, comes from a relational uh, databases. We can uh, maintain semi-structures, uh, structured documents of all kinds, and we also know how to deal with unstructured textual uh, data. We, our data store is highly reliable. We are fully ACID, um, and I guess all of you know what, uh, what ACID means. No need to get uh, into it. Uh, with the high availability, uh, that is a part of our architecture. No need to take care of that uh, separately. And uh, we have an event-driven uh, data freshness uh, mechanism as well. I will uh, get into it a little bit later. Um, yeah, regarding uh, performance, uh, uh, our uh, in-memory data grid is uh, uh, has uh, the ability to uh, uh, take very heavy workloads uh, with high concurrency of users and with the low latency, uh, thanks to uh, the in-memory nature and to the work with the multiple partition, partitions that uh, allow a quick uh, uh, processing of, uh, of data. Uh, so that was our uh, data, data grid. Uh, as, as you can see, all in all, it's a very, uh, robust uh, data store uh, that uh, uh, can ensure the, uh, the safe and fast uh, delivery of, uh, of data. Uh, 
promise you that I will talk about storage steering. So uh, this is a slide for that. Uh, a storage steering uh, feature uh, allows uh, you to balance between cost and uh, performance where the hot data, as we call it, uh, resides in, uh, in memory where it can be served uh, quickly and efficiently. And the uh, other data is uh, maintained in a, in a, on a disk, in a, on a fast access disk uh, where you uh, can still access it just like uh, the uh, hot data with a little bit uh, reduced uh, performance. Uh, all this um, uh, uh, the split between hot and warm data is done by business rules. So you can decide which data resides where uh, depending on the data age and depending on, um, on, on other uh, business, uh, business rules. Um, microservices, uh, it's very quick for us to uh, introduce new microservices. It's a, we have a low code microservices based on the SQL, where you can just create your microservice, introduce it to the, introduce it to the API gateway, and uh, then uh, manage its lifecycle easily by standard uh, DevOps, uh, DevOps tools. Uh, a couple of words about the holistic view of the data integrity. Since we are one holistic system and we are not uh, really three separated uh, layers, uh, we, we can assure uh, the full transactional uh, behavior from data source to data store. Uh, we, can, we can assure the validation of the data and the, uh, apply logics in the data store as well as in the ingestion um, uh, process and uh, we uh, provide monitoring tools in order to to see that the data completeness and identify any issues if occur as well as as i mentioned data freshness that uh, we know to identify issues with data on the data on the data source and reflect them in the uh, api um, all orchestration is done by kubernetes standard Kubernetes were natively a uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster. Uh, so uh, you, you can actually uh, deploy your whole system on top of, uh, of our services as part of, of the same Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we use all the, the classic and standard uh, tools. I will not uh, get into them uh, right now. And we have vast management and control tools, uh, UI and CLI for all three layers for monitoring and troubleshooting. Uh, so we, we can identify any, any issue and we can operate it uh, from within uh, those tools. Uh, regarding deployment, I mentioned that our ability to replicate uh, our cluster to different uh, locations. It, can be on-prem, it can be cloud, either private cloud or public cloud. Uh, so just to name a few of the topologies that are supported as part of it, this is a natural or native cloud um, deployment where we have one cluster that resides on the cloud. Um, we have the hybrid on-prem cloud. We can have two clusters that one is replicated to the other. Uh, by the way, replication can be bidirectional, but it can also be a, a subset of the original cluster. So, for instance, we can have uh, some uh, data or the full data resides on-prem and we can replicate only a portion of it that is relevant for our cloud applications uh, to our cloud uh, cluster. Uh, Multi-cloud, we can... Uh, have a multi-cloud deployment where data resides on different clouds. Again, each cloud may hold a subset of the of the whole data for different purposes. You can use one cloud for analytics, another cloud for a, a serving applications, etc. And then we can also hold the more sophisticated uh, deployments where you have multiple clusters on-prem, multiple clusters on cloud. Uh, and you can uh, uh, synchronize uh, between them all uh, bidirectionally. Well, to, uh, to summarize 
to summarize that, uh, a SMILE DIH uh, unique value uh, is our fully acid in memory data grid that is optimized for speed and scale. Uh, we support all kinds of uh, data formats, as I mentioned, stu structured, same structured, unstructured. Uh, we have a fast and seamless uh, data source integration with the no downtime down uh, required. Uh, inherent support for uh, different uh, topologies, just to name a few, hybrid, multi-cloud, uh, disaster recovery, high availability of uh, all kinds, um, multi-protocol for our APIs and the ability to um, communicate and integrate with an API management tool and as well as freshness awareness. And um, we have the storage tiering that is uh, driven by uh, business rules uh, for uh, cost optimizations. Uh, so that was a quick overview of our smart edge uh, solution. Uh, now Noam uh, will get a little bit into actual use cases of uh, our smart edge. Thank you, Ari. Uh, so we'll just take a, a few minutes to, to discuss, uh, to, to, to take a look at some, some uh, use cases. So if you're looking at uh, kind of uh, horizontal use cases, the two main use cases where a digital integration hub um, can really be valuable. Um, uh, first one is uh, application modernization. So uh, a DIH is a great enabler uh, for application modernization. Uh, and we can see here how it's really done. So if you look, starting from the left, um, step one is you are decoupling, right? So you are adding a DIH, which is kind of a middleware. Uh, you are decoupling between the digital applications and the systems of record. At step two, you are starting to modernize your, your application, your system of record applications, and you can do it at any pace um, that, that, that you like, whatever it makes sense to you. So in this example, we are starting with uh, this guy, uh, maybe moving it to the cloud, and then we can uh, do the next one and the next one. And uh, at the end of this journey, if you look at step number three, uh, we were able to modernize all our applications or system of record applications, and they are all connecting to the DIH. What's really powerful, and the reason why, why a DIH is a great uh, enabler for application modernization is that once we decoupled, um, the digital applications at the top don't really care, right? What's going on at the bottom? They don't really need to know uh, the data model as it is at the original system of record. You know, maybe something is coming from mainframe DB2 and some other data is coming from Oracle. And then maybe we have some NoSQL, you know, document type data as well, right? Once we decoupled, we have a unified data model in the system of record, right? In this uh, high performance uh, data store that is in the middle. And when we are modernizing the applications at the bottom, uh, we don't need to do to make much changes. Sometimes we don't need to change at all any of the coding at the application uh, at the top. So this is one kind of major uh, use case, uh, allow for gradual uh, modernization. You don't have to do it all at once. Uh, you don't have to do all of them, by the way, uh, and uh, decoupling the impact from those uh, digital uh, applications at the top. The next one, kind of similar concept, but here we are talking about the journey to the cloud. So a DIH is also a great enabler for cloud migration. When we are talking about cloud migration, uh, it might be that your, um, the, the end result that you're looking for is a complete move to the cloud, right? All the way to the cloud. And in some other cases, maybe your, uh, your, end, your journey needs to end in a hybrid mode. Right? You want to stay hybrid. In other words, uh, some of your applications, some of your data is on-prem. There are a lot of reasons why uh, you want to still do that. And some other applications uh, are going to be on the cloud. So either way, um, DIH can really uh, be great in this journey. So again, we start on the left by just decoupling. Right? So we have our uh, on-prem systems of record. We are adding the DIH. We are decoupling between the, the digital applications at the top and all those data stores and systems of record. And then we are gradually moving um, uh, systems of record or system of record applications to the cloud. What we see here in this example is that we can add another DIH, right? So at step number two, we have we really have two uh, DIHs. The one on the left is uh, the one on-prem and it keeps talking to the on-prem systems of record, but we have another cloud DIH. 
and we can replicate the data. So you have real-time replication uh, on the cloud representing the same data that we have available uh, on the on-prem DIH. And we, then we can gradually uh, introduce uh, those cloud systems of record to, to talk to that uh, cloud DIH. So um, like I said, sometimes you want to end the journey in this configuration, which is a hybrid configuration. Uh, and sometimes you want to go all the way and then you reach step number three, where eventually uh, all your systems of record were converted to the cloud. You have a DIH in the cloud. And at that point, you don't really even need the first DIH, the one on-prem, and you completed your uh, cloud journey. So those were two kind of uh, horizontal uh, use cases. But if you want to take a really brief look at uh, examples of vertical use cases, right? So if we, um, you know, think about uh, financial services, you know, banks and trading. So think about things like instant payments or trading and trading can be, you know, real time trading platforms, algo trading and the like, and also what we need to do after, right? The post trade uh, reconciliation, because every day we have to you know, reconcile and then report it back to the regulator, etc. Uh, also, things think about things like uh, calculating risk, right? Credit risk, market risk, uh, fraud detection. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, that we can do in financial services. But uh, we have lots of other examples in other verticals, uh, whether it's uh, logistics, whether it's uh, operations, uh, in insurance situations where a very typical uh, use case is customer 360, again, uh, being able to grab all those silos uh, and present a, a coherent view of the customer, both internally and, and to, the end, uh, to the end user, to the customer themselves on the, on the digital channel. Uh, transportation, forecasting, operations. So there's a lot, a lot of different uh, use cases uh, where uh, digital integration hub uh, can be a great, uh, great uh, uh, enabler. So uh, we would like to, uh, you have a three minutes left and we would like to uh, um, do a, a quick Q&A session. So you have the Q&A box. Uh, so please feel free to um, we'll take a moment uh, and write us in this box any questions that you may have for, for myself or for Ari. Uh, so we'll uh, uh, maybe pause, uh, give you guys a chance to, uh, to post any questions that you may have. And uh, just uh, while we wait, um, just in terms of the, the context, we started today with kind of digital transformation 101. We talked about the concept of, or the architecture of a, of a digital integration hub, and we drill, drill down just a little bit, uh, but we have a lot more to share with you guys. So, you know, please visit us on our website. Uh, we have live demos, we have technical uh, collaterals, uh, we have upcoming events and webinars. This is, by the way, the one that you see here um, on the screen is, is the next webinar that we have in July. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, uh, Kubernetes and data replication and including the live demo. So um, thank you guys for your time. Uh, please, again, you have an opportunity if you haven't posted your, your questions uh, on the Q&A box. Um, now is your chance. And Let's pause for a moment and let's take a look at the questions um, that we got. Um, so one question that we have is, will it be possible to see it again, the recorded session? Of course, everybody that signed up to this session, including the ones that didn't have a chance to join us today, uh, anyone that signed up will get a, um, a link, an email with a, a link to a, a recording uh, of the session. So no worries there. Um, let me take a look at. Other questions that are coming up. Again, we still have a few minutes, so feel free to uh, to post some more questions for us. And let's take uh, the next question. And the question is, uh, that's a question for you, Ari. Uh, you mentioned data segregation with relation to Kubernetes. What other security methods um, do you employ? 
Okay, uh, so uh, security. We will employ several uh, security mechanisms in order to ensure security from different uh, aspects. Uh, all of them are standard uh, security uh, mechanisms, uh, just uh, to name the, the main ones. Uh, we, we have different uh, levels on the very bottom level, the uh, persistence uh, layer. Uh, we have data in rest encryption, support for data in, in rest encryption, where you can customize it to work with any encryption and method that uh, you like. We have a role-based access control for both data security as well as uh, operations uh, security over the data grid. Uh, we, we secure data transport using standard uh, protocols, SSL, TLS. And we interact with this uh, with an API gateway that allows you to uh, apply uh, services uh, security on the API gateway uh, level. Uh, we use the Spring Security Framework as a general uh, framework uh, of our uh, security features, and we know how to integrate with uh, all kinds of enterprise systems like uh, uh, Active Directory, like uh, Vault for Keys and Secrets, and the different uh, control systems in order to uh, monitor uh, the system health in terms of uh, security and other aspects. Great, thank you, Ari. Uh, let's take the next question. How would you go uh, about building a DIH uh, if you use a MongoDB? Okay, this is a great question. So we didn't have a chance uh, today to, to focus so much about uh, how do you actually get there? How do you get to a DIH uh, architecture? And, and maybe we can, uh, we'll cover that in, an, um, in another session. But just to, to answer this question, uh, like generally speaking, DIH is an architecture and you can get there in different ways. One way is, is really to build it yourself, right? So if you wanna use an existing, and there are so many different uh, you know, data stores that you can use, you know, the Mongo in this question is one example. There are the other examples. But a DIH is way bigger than just a database, right? A DIH architecture, if you remember the slide that we've seen, uh, a DIH architecture requires you lots of different building blocks, right? You have the data store, but you also need to have, uh, it has to be high performance. So if it's not really fast and in memory, sometimes you need to add a cache on top of that. Then you need to take care of the data integration, right? Then you need to take care of uh, of uh, uh, event-based integration. You need to take care of the uh, data service at the top. And there are many other uh, building blocks. So building it yourself is one way to get there. Uh, it, it will require a bunch of different components, maybe from different vendors. Uh, maybe some of them can be open source, but uh, you know, very importantly, it will require a lot of integration between all those components to get to this uh, you know, fine-tuned uh, DIH architecture. So that's one way to get there. Um, again, and you can use different databases, uh, data stores at the core of it, but you always have to remember that a database, like a pure database is not a DIH, it's just a part of the DIH. And another option is to get uh, kind of an out of the box, something ready-made, which is all, already includes all the building blocks uh, pre-integrated, our uh, our offering, Smart DIH, the one that, that was just described by Ari, is, is one example for you to get all those uh, pre-integrated components so you can, you can uh, your time to, to market, your time to value uh, is much, much faster. Um, let's see, so we still have some few more minutes left. Let's take some more questions. Uh, just in case we don't get uh, to all the questions, uh, no worries, we will follow up with anyone who posted a question uh, offline. So no worries, feel free to, to post more questions. Um, and the next question is, um, you mentioned CDCs, what CDCs do you offer? So, uh, so yes, I mentioned CDC, CDC or change um, data capture is really the component or the technology that is used to go from uh, this request-based integration to event-based integration. In other words, to make sure that um, you have a DIH that always reflects the most up-to-date data. Every time we have a data event, uh, it immediately it will be reflected and updated uh, in the DIH. Again, the digital application doesn't need to worry about it at all. From the digital application standpoint, 
uh, you are only accessing single place, which is al always includes uh, the latest and greatest of the data that you need. So, so going back to the question, so CDC, uh, so we uh, have embedded CDC in our solution. It's part of the, of the digital integration hub. Of course, you can use your own. So there are CDCs from, from multiple uh, providers. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have some kind of CDC in-house, and if you want to use that as well. By the way, CDC is one way to integrate, right? Obviously, for a kind of real-time streaming of data events. Another use case is ETL, uh, and, and that's a different uh, use case. Usually, it's a batch update of a large number of, of records that, that were uh, changed. And we support both CDCs and ETLs uh, that you may have in your uh, environment. But if you want to use the one that we have coming out of the box, then it's pre-integrated uh, with the solution. All right, so we have a little bit more time left. Let's uh, see, uh, let's take another question. A moment. All right, uh, let's take a question for you, Ari. Um, since DIH is a middleware, what high availability capabilities do you have to maintain a 24 seven uh, service level? Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we have a few um, uh, modules that, that can uh, handle uh, high availability as well as uh, resiliency for uh, different uh, purposes. Uh, first of all, I mentioned uh, that we have an inherent a resiliency mechanism. We have our partitions, we have uh, automatic backup partitions for all uh, our partitions for the purpose of uh, being highly available. So if one of the partitions uh, has any failure, immediately the system uh, will uh, flip uh, to uh, its twin partition and we keep serving um, with, with the same uh, level of service. And uh, later on when the uh, original partition comes up, um, uh, it will uh, be used as a, as a new backup. And uh, this is one mechanism that is fully synchronized and fully supported out of the box. We have other uh, mechanisms for uh, uh, resiliency and for recovery, uh, such as our mirroring mechanism that uh, provides the ability uh, to um, uh, uh, backup uh, the data uh, depending on the uh, update events on a remote uh, database. We have our one gateway uh, that uh, allows us to uh, replicate the data into other clusters for uh, disaster recovery scenarios and as such. And uh, of course, we have the, the ability uh, to uh, back up the data on the disk as part of our uh, uh, data, uh, data tiering. Uh, uh, actually, I believe I did not mention it, but this uh, a uh, module provides also a uh, persistency capabilities. So um, uh, it allows you to uh, back up the data uh, on a disk uh, that, uh, and recover from it uh, when coming up again after a failure. Great, thank you, Ari. Uh, let's take one last question because we are kind of running out of time. Um, so final question for today. Again, I, uh, as I said, uh, if we didn't get to your question, we'll follow up with you offline. Let's take the, one, the last one. This is an interesting one. Um, Ari, for you as well. Uh, can I query uh, multiple data sources in one SQL uh, query? Okay. Actually, I think it's a very good question because we didn't get to touch SQL in this uh, presentation, but uh, one of our uh, methods of exposing uh, the data is using standard as uh, SQL. This is how uh, the uh, visualizers, the, the BI tools can interact uh, with our uh, uh, data grid. Uh, we, we expose a standard SQL using the PG wire uh, protocol. And uh, we, we support uh, most of the standard uh, specifications of SQL uh, 99. Uh, this SQL uh, allows us to query, uh, since we're a hub and we upload all the uh, data sources up to uh, that hub, uh, the, the origin of it does not matter. So you can query any of uh, those uh, tables or uh, data sets that uh, reside on, uh, on that uh, space or in the data grid and uh, do any joins and queries on top of, of them. 
combining different uh, data sources, no problem at all. Awesome, great. Thank you so much, Ari. And uh, since we ran out of time, that, that uh, would be the last question. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, I hope it was an, an interesting session for you. Please uh, visit us on our website. We have a lot of uh, more detailed uh, uh, content there. Uh, and please join us in our upcoming uh, events. Thank you and uh, have a great day. Thank you.